Good morning and uh, welcome to our latest episode of our Pacific series. Uh, picking up from where we left off in December when we covered geopolitical shifts in the Pacific Islands, our session today will focus on environmental security in the region. As a large grouping of diverse atoll nations, the Pacific Islands have been at the forefront of the fight against climate change. And in this process, um, environmental security is considered a cornerstone of the new security discourse. However, with the scope of the concept of security broadening uh, to now include the environmental dimension, uh, recent years have shown that there's a growing rift or even an outright clash between the more traditional hard security concerns and the environmental security concerns. And to shed light on the security divide and the implications for the Pacific nations, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Mark Lantain with us today, who is an associate professor of political science at the Arctic University in Norway. He was previously a senior lecturer in security studies at Massey University in New Zealand, where he uh, had the opportunity to conduct fieldwork in the Pacific region. So without further ado, uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Larissa, and thank you very much uh, to all the attendees. Apologies for the technical difficulties uh, last time. We had a small internet cut which couldn't get resolved in time. So keeping fingers crossed, we're able to um, resolve that this time around. So thank you very much. And what I would like to do with this session is to talk a little bit about how uh, the field of environmental security has um, expanded over the past two decades and where the Pacific Islands fit in quite a bit of the studies. Now, just to give a bit of background and I'm going to attempt to share screen. Okay. So for a great deal of time, there was um, a bit of a divide between environmental and security studies. And what I've been seeking to do with my research, including what I was doing in the Pacific region, is to discuss how environmental security has become more mainstreamed, if you will, into more common areas of international security discourse. So I would say up until about uh, potentially the 1990s, it was very common to treat environmental security as essentially low politics, that it simply didn't have the same amount of urgency or the same amount of weight as traditional high politics, which meant um, primarily material security having to do with uh, both weaponry and material goods. But the fact is there's been a variety of more recent events, including the rise of global warming, uh, the growth and internationalization of climate change concerns, which has helped uh, shape the study of environmental security. And as I'm gonna be explaining, it's also caused a great deal of diversification about how environmental security is commonly studied. Now, there are quite a few different uh, definitions of environmental security. This one that I'm using is one of the more common. And I do want to point out one uh, particular point to this, um, this interpretation. So the ability of individuals and groups and quite often states to avoid or adapt to environmental change without adverse effects. And what I'd like to do is underline the concept of avoid or adapt. And this is a debate which we're seeing in many parts of the world, including in the Pacific Islands. Uh, the big debate over where the tipping point is, how close we are to it, or have we actually surpassed it? And this is obviously going to have very significant effects on many parts of the world, including the Pacific. Now, when we talk about environmental change, uh, again, very often studied in different directions. It could either be short or long-term, it could be caused by natural events, or it could be caused by human intervention. So these are the debates that environmental security is currently wrestling with. But there has been an attempt to further um, clarify what exactly we're talking about here, how best to actually study this area. And there are six particular approaches that are now being uh, looked at very carefully. The first Mark, two, I, I would say, are the most common. Mark, can I very quickly interrupt you? Your presentation sure. apparently is not showing. Oh, dear. Okay, mm -hmm. one moment. Thanks. Let's see what the problem is. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to try to share screen again. How is that? Now it's working, yes. Okay, good, all right, let me see. And just quickly, Mark, I think now you're sharing from your desktop. Yes, I am. Um, uh, it might be better to share from the actual PowerPoint presentation so that we don't see any notifications and such. Okay, one moment. How is that? Perfect. Excellent. The okay. only thing is, um, we can see this happen once before. We can see the little um, different windows, but maybe that's okay with you. Oh, okay. That's funny. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not going to press my luck here <laughs> though, as long as everyone can see it. Okay. Apologies for that. Okay. So, just to um, just to reiterate, so we're seeing a diversification of uh, environmental security analyses, and there are six different, shall we say, uh, schools of thought that are uh, starting to be known. And the first two are certainly the most common, but I would say all six are starting to grow in importance and can also be uh, seen as relevant to Pacific affairs. So the first and probably the most common, ecological security. So how does various human activity affect ecosystems? And that could mean uh, land, plant life, water, and air. Common security looks at how these issues transcend traditional politics and traditional nation states. Most of these issues simply cannot be addressed by countries acting alone. And state sovereignty um, can therefore be seen as actually a, an obstacle to collective action. We've seen many examples of this, especially actions taken place on an international scale to develop uh, environmental agreements. The third, environmental violence. We are starting to see evidence. And for those who are looking at, for example, Central Asia or Southwest Asia, we're starting to see very significant linkages between environmental change caused by uh, climate change, um, droughts, for example, and heightened chances for conflict. And this obviously will lead to issues related to human mobility and the actual ability to um, use land effectively. Okay. The fourth would be national security. How does the environment place national security at risk, including affecting uh, military and economic capabilities? And it's been plainly seen and simply looking at a cursory example of the history of the Pacific Islands, we've seen the legacy of nuclear weapons testing in the region on the environment. And there's been some very good studies even recently on the subject. Then you have greening defense. And this is a very interesting question. Um, can military activities be green in nature? And it may sound like a complete disconnect, but it is something that is being looked at very carefully because we've seen multiple examples of environmental effects which can last well into peacetime. And finally, you have the subject of human security. Like it's all very good to talk about um, environmental threats to states, to economies, to uh, something very large and abstract, but what are the environmental threats to the individual, including issues of poverty, insecurity, and again, human migration. So this is how um, environmental security has become more diverse over the past uh, few decades. And what I've been seeking to do is to try to expand this issue into the Pacific Islands region. The Pacific is facing a lot of challenges related to each of these issues, uh, starting with the uh, very noticeable effects, very measurable effects of sea level rise and temperature changes, uh, causing erosion in some cases, land uplift in others. So shifts in land, as well as the ability to grow crops. The other point that's starting to be looked at very carefully is the fact that even though many uh, states in the Pacific region are small in terms of their land area, they are large ocean states and therefore have a great deal of maritime space that need to be monitored, not only in terms of issues like uh, fishing and uh, just civilian ship movement, but also in regards to environmental conditions. And third, and this is becoming a little bit more pressing in light of recent events, uh, what are the best methods of regional and sub-regional cooperation in the Pacific to address environmental challenges? 
We've heard in the news recently the withdrawal of uh, Micronesian nations from the Pacific Islands Forum over the past few weeks. It remains to be seen exactly how um, this kind of uh, challenge to the PIF is going to affect environmental cooperation. You have the problem of migration and you have the problem of the concept of environmental refugees, which is not something which has been looked at until very recently in legal discourse, but we are starting to see examples of it now. We are looking at scenarios whereby a Pacific state is threatened to the point of extinction due to environmental uh, concerns. And therefore, what are the legal obligations of other states to address environmental refugees? Then you have the question of the return, assuming it actually really left, of geopolitics in the Pacific and especially the effects of great power competition. We are starting to see a lot of examples of competition between traditional powers in the region, uh, especially in the case of Australia and New Zealand, and also the activities of newer players, um, China, India, and various other states in East and Southeast Asia. And finally, you have the question of health and human security. Uh, like many other parts of the world, uh, COVID has affected the Pacific region significantly. It has caused major economic hits on several fronts. And therefore, there is the question of how uh, environmental security can affect current and future areas related to health. So that was my starting point. This is trying to lay out some of the major questions and some of the major variables of um, environmental security studies in the region. And I had the opportunity when I was working in New Zealand to go out and to try to look at ways of how environmental security has been interpreted. And I want to share for the remainder of my presentation an example related to the country of Tuvalu, which is a small state in the Pacific. Uh, as you can see, north of New Zealand, it is a very small country in regards to land, but quite large in terms of maritime area. And I had the opportunity while doing field work in Tuvalu to really understand how uh, various areas of environmental security have affected the country. And as you can see by the map, this is uh, a country that has the great potential to be affected by various areas of climate change especially in the case of sea level rise and sea warming. Now, just to give a few stats, um, the population of Tuvalu is quite small, slightly more than 11,000, but there's also a very large population of Tuvaluans who live outside of the country, primarily in Australia and New Zealand. It has a very small land area, as you can see, but also a very large exclusive economic zone. Its elevation uh, averages two meters, its highest point is five meters. So that alone gives you an idea of how vulnerable the country is to a potential sea level rise. It also has a, an economy very much dependent on connections with other parts of the Pacific. And it also has a great deal of, um, shall we say economic uh, sensitivity and vulnerability to effects in the region, including those that are related to environmental security. Its major economic partners, primarily Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan. Uh, but at the same time, there is also a lot of concern about how the political changes in the Pacific region will affect the Tuvaluan economy as a whole. Now, I want to share some pictures. I can do this, yes. Okay, I wanna share some pictures that I took which um, illustrate some of the um, particular areas of environmental security which are very important to the country. Now, the picture on the left, this is taken on the extreme northern tip of Funafuti, which is the main island in Tuvalu. Now, my timing was a bit off with this because if you look to the left of the photo, you will see um, the inner lagoon. Uh, it's very much low tide. So you don't get the full effect of just how surreal standing on this road was because you can see by the green space that when the lagoon is a little bit uh, closer to the shore, you have a very small amount of space uh, between the lagoon on one side and you can see the ocean to the right. And a lot of concerns have been expressed that in light of uh, environmental changes in the region, the country is extremely vulnerable to uh, extreme weather, which is becoming more of a concern due to climate change and it is becoming uh, more vulnerable to sea level rise. And I stress again, you can't really see from the photo just how kind of surreal it was to see kind of these two bodies of water um, within a very short distance of each other. 
The uh, second photo, the one in the middle, this was a coconut palm, which was dedicated by uh, then Taiwanese uh, President Ma Ying-jeou. And the other opportunity that I had in Tuvalu was to get a feel for how Taiwan, which is uh, a major diplomatic and economic partner for Tuvalu, has been attempting to uh, assist the country in addressing and potentially adapting to environmental change. Uh, various projects that um, Taiwan has undertaken in the country include, uh, for example, fish farms, growing uh, local fish that are not affected by mercury as well as experimental farming, including the growing of crops which would not be uh, as susceptible to salt water. The photo on the right uh, really underscores the uh, water security that is prevalent in the country. Tuvalu has no rivers. It is based on a coral atoll. So as you might imagine, uh, water can be a very sensitive subject. So these containers donated by the European Union are used to collect rainwater. And there have been periods of extreme drought in uh, Tuvalu, which has resulted in the need for outside countries to truck in or bring in fresh water in order to deal with the emergency. And again, we don't know yet to what degree changing weather patterns in the region will affect potentially uh, the problem of water availability. So two more photos before I conclude. Um, this is another shot of the lagoon to the left. And as you can see, the algae growth here, that is being measured. Uh, I had, had a chance to talk to some specialists when I was there. This is being measured uh, directly as a result of not only sea level rise, but sea level warming. So we're seeing changes in temperature, which are leading to changes in the local plant life. This is causing concern about fish that have been caught in the lagoon. It is uh, something which was seen as less safe as it used to be. And on the right, you see a uh, basically a garbage disposal site. Now, the good news is a lot of this has been since cleared out since I took that picture. But it also uh, underscores the problem of waste storage. Uh, you can't bury it. You can't really do anything with it except leave it uh, on basically on land. And the amount of land available for uh, this kind of disposal is obviously very limited. So again, the country has been dependent on outside actors in order to deal with waste disposal issues. Now, this has also been a result of shifts in uh, patterns regarding, uh, for example, food consumption, that uh, packaged food has become much more popular in the country, and that has obviously led to issues of packaging. So each of these photos, and this is just a small sample of how various areas of environmental security have affected the region using Tuvalu as a case study. So to conclude, the observations that we've seen, um, we're now having very considerable debates, including, uh, for example, in New Zealand about how to define an environmental refugee and what is the responsibility of states and state governments to address them. This is a very thorny political subject, not only in New Zealand, but also in Australia and other parts of the region. The law, if you will, is still kind of running to catch up to the issue of environmental refugees. The other question is, that can you link the environment with security? And how is environmental security changing security studies as a whole? There's been a lot of debate in the discipline uh, in political science about uh, securitization, about how a particular issue, uh, first of all, is made political and then is turned into a security issue. So how has that process been undertaken in regards to the environment? What is now causing environmental insecurity? And this may seem obvious, but we are starting to really look at the various factors, specific factors, that cause environmental insecurity, including in the Pacific region. In the area of environmental issues, can human security, so the security of the individual and the security of the state, national security, can they be reconciled? Do they conflict with each other? Uh, is there uh, a growing overlap between the two? And one could argue that, yes, that is the case. And I would also add that you could also point to the connections between human security and regional security in the case of the Pacific, because it is understood, and this has been one area where the Pacific has the potential to cooperate a lot, is there's a great deal of commonality amongst the environmental security concerns throughout the region.
And this is why I'm a little bit concerned about the situation with the Pacific Islands Forum, because it is viewed understandably as uh, the most inclusive uh, regime designed to deal with a great deal of common security concerns throughout the region. So how will this split affect needed dialogue on environmental issues? And finally, I leave everyone with the question, how are these issues specifically relevant to the Pacific? Is the Pacific an area of exceptionalism? Can the Pacific be seen as a kind of warning light for other parts of the world? Um, what kind of lessons has environmental security dialogue from the Pacific? What lessons can uh, be taught to the greater international community? And I will leave this with a picture I took on the beach of Tuvalu and considering that it's freezing rain right, uh, here right now, I very much prefer this picture over outside my window. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. And that picture is indeed very, very lovely, um, especially from, from a gray Stockholm today. Um, thank you so much for this very insightful presentation. You brought up so many, so many potential points for discussion. Um, one thing that I would like to, to ask before I give the floor to questions from the audience um, is how does the Tuvaluan government reconcile this division? Have you had any, any possibility to, to contact them, to, to speak to them? How do they perceive this and how do they address this very divide? Okay, sorry, the division specifically? Sorry, I yes. guess. So how, how do they address this, this notion of, of national security and environmental security, this, this kind of division? Yes, thanks. It's an excellent question. And the short answer would be, in many cases, one and the same. Because unlike other uh, parts of the Pacific, let's say Fiji, that have a slightly more uh, kind of stable environmental situation, we have seen uh, mounting evidence that Tuvalu is especially susceptible to various areas of climate change. Like, uh, for example, the urgency of uh, trying to develop crops that are able to stand up to salt water is partially due to the fact that you have seawater starting to push its way up through the coral and affect various uh, kind of land areas in the middle of Funafuti. So that was seen as obviously a great danger. And there has been a great deal of discussion in the Tuvaluan government about, okay, what happens if we get to the point of no return? What happens if we get to the point where we will need to consider essentially evacuation? And this is obviously a very difficult subject. We're not talking about evacuating a small, um, part of a country, we're talking about evacuating an entire country. So the debate is very much there. And a lot of it does have to do with uh, what are going to be the politics behind this in addition to the logistics. Indeed. And, and just harking back to, to what you said about the, the political environment, do you think there's, there's um, this, does the Tuvaluan bureaucracy maybe impede on this very process, maybe like ministerial divisions? Do you think that plays a role in, in how this uh, is perpetuated in the long run? I think we are starting to see quite a few debates within the Tuvaluan government over going back to the original question, uh, either avoidance or adaptation, which should be the uh, most important aspect. Uh, there's been all kinds of discussions relating to seawalls, relating to uh, potential like augmentation of land, how that would work. And we are starting to see some divisions over what that will mean, especially because we are dealing in addition with limited economic means. And one kind of looming question is uh, what the post-pandemic recession in the Pacific as a whole will do to those calculations. All right, thank you very much. I think that was also the one of the questions we just received. Um, in what ways has the COVID-19 pandemic had an impact on the debates considering uh, climate change and environmental security in the Pacific Islands? If you would like to, to add a few points to that. Yes, I would. And this is something which has been discussed in the run up to what happened at the last uh, PIF meeting. There has been a great deal of focus on um, regional discussions about the environment on face-to-face -face meetings and the ability to basically reach common solutions. This has obviously been hampered by the fact that Zoom diplomacy is now the order of the day in the Pacific just due to geographical constraints. And it has underscored the fact, and sounds obvious, but it's really been brought home. The Pacific is a very large region and it is very complicated geographically to come to agreements on many different issues, including areas of economic cooperation, as well as the environment. Uh, 
And what is going to be a pressing question now is uh, whether there will need to be kind of a pause in some areas of environmental policy with the priority being we need to rebuild our economies. We need to really uh, rework our economies to hopefully put everything back to pre-COVID levels. Okay, thank you so much. Um, before I go to the next question, I'd like to maybe address the elephant in the room, which is um, the US is now back in the Paris Climate Agreement. There have been talks about uh, Biden uh, being invited to the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, also John Kerry as the special envoy for climate change. What do you think this, this pivot of the US is going to do uh, to this very debate about uh, national security and environmental security in terms from a geopolitical perspective? Yeah. I would say uh, in the onset, it is extremely good news that the United States is back in the Paris Accord and that we are starting to see some extremely serious moves of the incoming Biden administration to put climate change back on the priority list. This is not only going to be important to the Pacific, but there's a lot of debate up here about how this is going to improve cooperation in the Arctic on climate change issues. And one very important focus that we've seen in the Pacific is uh, various endeavors to internationalize the issue of how climate change is affecting the region. Um, I very frequently attend Arctic Circle conferences, which uh, normally take place every year in Reykjavik, and they're primarily uh, organizations of Arctic specialists and policymakers. But over the past uh, few years, uh, we've seen delegations from the Pacific um, attend these meetings. And even though we're talking about two vastly different geographies, many of the issues are the same. That climate change is having significant developmental, economic, and political effects. So the kind of return of the United States to the region, I think, is going to be uh, presenting a lot of opportunities for Pacific governments to, again, say that, look, this is not something that is local. This is not something which is only affecting a small area. This has not only regional, but international ramifications. Okay, just linking up to this, um, we have a question from Johannes, who asks, to what extent do outside powers use the environmental security issue to deepen their engagement with the region? Yes, excellent question. And I think we are going to see, especially with the United States uh, planning on getting back to the Asia Pacific, I think we are going to be seeing a flurry, or I'd say an uptick of environmental diplomacy from many different quarters. For example, uh, looking at Taiwan's activities in Tuvalu was quite fascinating. Like I had a chance to visit some of the um, project locales, including the, uh, the fishing uh, project, as well as the agricultural projects. Taiwan has also been seeking to develop uh, solar energy for uh, its uh, friends and allies in the Pacific. And I think that uh, what Taiwan has really been trying to focus, um, some specialists have referred to it as cat diplomacy, small but versatile. Whereas um, other countries, for example, China, have also started to adapt a more kind of green approach to the region as it too has been trying to uh, position itself as a regional partner. And I think that this should be also a priority for the Biden government specific policy that there needs to be a very strong kind of green dimension, if you will, to the US return to the region. But you also see examples of other major players, Australia and New Zealand have both incorporated um, environmental affairs into their reset policies for the region. We have seen some significant work uh, in Japan also to bring their expertise to the area. So I think there's a lot of, um, there's going to be a lot of focus on environmental diplomacy. And I think that in order for any external power to really portray themselves as uh, a partner to the region, a very strong and robust green policy is going to be necessary. Certainly, and it seems the US is, is back on track with John Kerry now being deployed as, as this, uh, yeah, as the, the special envoy. Um, maybe staying on the topic of, of foreign powers and geopolitics, um, you already hinted at it in your presentation, the, the recent split uh, of the Pacific Islands Forum. What, what do you expect uh, going forward? I mean, there's a 12 month withdrawal period um, and three countries have already started this, this very process. Yeah. But do you think that there's a chance to, to reconcile this based on the, the fact that uh, 
climate change and environmental security is such a big issue for all of them. Do you think that could be an opportunity for them to, to get back together, despite the differences? I, I really hope so, because uh, I think it's going to be difficult in the short term. I think that politics, um, regional politics, have certainly caused quite a few uh, divisions, which hopefully with a bit more time can be ironed out. Because again, at the end of the day, and many uh, regional policymakers have said this, we do have a lot of commonality in terms of our regional interests. Very top of the list are environmental. But the fact is there's been a tendency in the region towards sub-regionalism. We have seen uh, the three major sub-regions start to kind of pull away a bit over issues such as Fijian politics, over issues such as uh, external diplomacy, and obviously uh, differences in terms of what regionalism in the Pacific should be about. But I'm hoping that once the kind of dust has settled a bit, and, and there is a possibility for at least uh, kind of in the hallway diplomacy to maybe try to smooth out uh, the differences and to hopefully prevent this split from taking place, because I really do not see that as being very healthy for the region, either politically or environmentally, or economically for that matter. Uh, very true indeed. And um, before I go to the next question, I was just wondering what, what exactly do you, would you like to see New Zealand and Australia to, to do at this very point? I mean, given that they are part of the Pacific Islands Forum. Yeah, I think there needs to be like having looked at the kind of uh, rejuvenation policies, uh, the kind of reset policies, if you will, that both countries have uh, engaged in. Like when I had the chance to visit um, some of the uh, countries in the region, I was talking quite a bit about, you know, the various different diplomatic styles of some of the external powers. And what I would very often hear is that, you know, I wish that Australia and New Zealand uh, would kind of listen to kind of the local issues a little bit more, like not necessarily pay so much close attention to country to country diplomacy. Um, and I think there also needs to be uh, a greater focus uh, by both countries to the fact that we are starting to see a diversification of actors in the region, which have their own uh, kind of uh, diplomatic priorities and uh, obviously different uh, policy viewpoints. And so there needs to be the understanding that there needs to be kind of greater uh, coordination among these external powers in order to understand the changes that are happening in the region. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Frida, who, uh, who asks, what impact can we expect a climate change to have on agriculture and food security in the region in the coming 10 years? Yes. Okay, so I think there's two elements to that. First of all, the direct impact on climate change has been felt in regards to, uh, for example, changes in seafood catches, changes in uh, the safety of seafood that are caught in inland lagoons. Um, we're starting to see shifts in um, sea temperatures, which as you saw from the photos has a, an effect on local algae patterns, greatly affecting the health of uh, local seafood and the ability to uh, catch fish for local consumption. We're also starting to see concerns about how much agriculture may be affected by sea level rise and potential changes in weather patterns, because in some cases we are talking about extremely vulnerable parts of the Pacific that are, have been traditionally uh, dependent on local crops. Now, what was happening in Tuvalu is you started to see uh, a greater focus on food imports from Australia, from New Zealand. And so that has caused changes to the local diet. It has also caused problems with packaging, which leads to obviously storage and waste removal and so forth. So you have these two issues, kind of availability of local food and the growing popularity of external food sources, creating a significant shift in regards to the local environment. Now, there was a focus when I was in Tuvalu, I was talking to some of the policymakers there about there needs to be a return to kind of local food, like local food needs to be um, accentuated and greater popularized. And that was a major campaign in a few countries I had a chance to visit, including Fiji and Tonga, with the understanding that obviously foreign food is very expensive to import and that it creates its own set of environmental headaches. And various projects such as growing uh, local crops and developing local seafood and uh, other local sources are kind of meant to kind of bring back uh, kind of traditional uh, patterns of food consumption. 
Very interesting. Um, one point, um, given that there's there's such a drive to to get back to local food production um, and to to really um, harness this this moment, um, what about foreign aid? How can foreign aid, um, especially from from the bigger regional neighbors such as Australia, and New Zealand, uh, from the US or maybe China, uh, be leveraged in in this case? Yeah, and that is a question that is being asked regarding what kind of diplomatic competition we will start to see in the region. Because again, there was all kinds of talk when I was in New Zealand about, okay, now we have to compete with China in regards to aid diplomacy. So that was something that I was looking at um, a bit when I was um, in the region. And I found out very quickly that yes, there is a little bit of, shall we say, political competition, a bit of you know, kind of playing off various potential donors. But realistically speaking, we are seeing differences in regards to aid priorities. Uh, while China has very often focused on infrastructure development, um, you have a bit more of a focus in Taiwan uh, in terms of education and kind of on the ground projects, including those that are very specifically targeted to deal with a specific issue such as food security, a similar approach by Japan. And in fact, um, when I was asked, because uh, I was coming from New Zealand, I was asked about, okay, how do you feel New Zealand is um, kind of developing its uh, regional diplomacy? Um, New Zealand's soft power is still very important in the region because it is seen as a major, for example, center of education for the Pacific. So there are different, even though aid, there's talk about increased competition, and this is going to lead to all kinds of problems of overlap, problems of miscommunication. I think that so far we are starting to see different approaches to the aid question. And there's certainly ways for the different actors to approach it differently for the benefit of everyone. But the concern though is if we start to see significant great power competition in the region, this could lead to the problem of overlap. And this could lead to the problem of increased politicization of the aid process, which will not help the environmental security situation much at all. True, and I, I guess, uh, especially in Tuvalu, this, this issue of um, this competition between China and Taiwan might also uh, impact this very uh, debate. Have you, when you were there, have you had a chance to, to have a look at this very issue of like diplomatic spats? Is, is there anything that, um, that stood out maybe? Yes, it was the case when I first was visiting there that there was a diplomatic truce uh, in place between Beijing and Taipei. So there was the understanding that, okay, you as long as you don't attempt to sway my allies, I will not do the same. So this was a period whereby I was able to have discussions about um, China-Taiwan affairs on a relatively even keel. And this was also a period where uh, there was a bit of uh, I would say kind of low level engagement about how each party was kind of conducting their uh, diplomatic affairs. For example, in the case of Fiji, I had the chance to go to the experimental agricultural project at Zikatoka. And this was done very matter of fact in the sense that, okay, we're here basically to study the effects of climate change on local crops. We're looking at these kind of initiatives to grow various crops and deal with various agricultural projects very heavy focus on environmental um, educational engagement between local scholars and those from Taiwan. And at the time, this was seen as as long as, you know, all parties kept the ideas of economics, everything was going quite well. But the diplomatic truce is over. We have already seen some uh, Pacific governments cross the floor. Uh, Tuvalu, the government of Tuvalu has made it very clear that it has no intention to do so. So I think we're starting to see a kind of regrouping of diplomatic priorities. But the fact is that we are starting to see some you know, very concerning um, moves in the China-Taiwan relationship. And another concern that I have is that this kind of issue might begin to, again, overshadow the pressing issues of environmental security. Yeah, I guess there's also um, been talk that the, the Pacific Island Forum split might um, induce some more competition. So we'll, we'll see how that pans out. We have another question uh, from Johannes. Uh, one of the key debates mentioned earlier was, can human and national security be reconciled? Could you elaborate on that in the context of the Pacific Islands and their approaches to state security? Okay. 
In the case of the Pacific, there has been a tendency in some studies to treat um, Pacific nations as kind of black boxes, like Tuvalu wants this, Kiribati wants this, Fiji wants this. And that is useful up to a particular point in order to understand where government priorities regarding environmental security are going. But it was really important uh, for those who are looking at regional environmental security to look at the situation on the ground, to look at the situation about how individuals, individual businesses, individual sectors are being directly affected by change in the region due to, uh, due to climate alterations. And that has sometimes gotten lost in quite a bit of the debate. Like you see uh, national agendas being put out to address climate change, but there also needs to be a focus, if you will, on kind of the lower levels of human security to understand how individuals are being affected. Because for example, we have many, I mentioned that uh, we have quite a few citizens of Tuvalu who are now overseas. And so that has led to the question of issues such as labor remittances, such as various travel, which is obviously much more restricted now. We have led to the questions about, okay, should tourism be developed and what would be the environmental impact of that versus uh, improvements to income? Uh, this is being debated like, there's the hope that once the pandemic situation subsides, there will be a significant uh, burst in travel and a great deal more interest in local tourism. How would various sectors uh, adjust to that? And what would be the benefits nationally versus individually? So there's a slew of questions that all kind of point to the fact that in order to really focus on environmental security, you really have to look at it as a multi-level process. Maybe just uh, going back a little bit, but it was uh, you raised very, very good points just now. Uh, what about um, education? What, what are the, the islands doing, or maybe Tuvalu in, in particular, to mm -hmm. educate their own population? I mean, I think it's one, one aspect to talk about educating maybe donors who come in and who, um, who might have a different perception of what, it, uh, what aid or development should look like. Um, and national education campaigns, I, I guess there's also uh, a lot of focus on that. Maybe you can elaborate a bit. Yes, okay. Well, to start with the example of um, what has been happening in Tuvalu. So Taiwan has placed a great deal of emphasis on educational cooperation, but they've also been stressing that this is a kind of two-way street, if you will. So when I was there, I had a chance to talk to some Taiwanese undergraduate students who were learning about local agricultural practices, and they were helping out um, developing and maintaining some of the projects. And Taiwan has also brought um, various students to Taiwan to learn about uh, various uh, developmental techniques there, uh, everything from engineering to environmental uh, concerns. So Taiwan has really stressed the idea that this education process has to be very holistic in nature, that it really has to encompass uh, all of the major parties and that all sides walk away with a great deal of benefit. And this is also something which other external powers such as Australia and New Zealand have also started to put more of a focus on to understand that it's not just a question of um, looking at different levels of education isolated from each other, that this has to be a combined process. And from a wider spectrum, um, I think there also needs to be a greater emphasis placed on kind of understanding exactly what should be the environmental priorities of each parts of the region. And I think kind of breaking that down is also starting to be a process we're seeing. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you could elaborate on the on the notion of, of migration as well. You brought it up, um, and I think there's going to be lots more in the coming years. And um, I guess it's one thing about uh, legal aspects of who is considered a climate refugee, especially on, on those um, low-lying island nations where, where sea level rise is, is probably going to threaten most of the populations. Um, what, what do you think is, is this going to do uh, to identity as well? I mean, uh, when you're forced to leave your, your territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so starting with the traditional definition of a refugee. So the idea is that someone is uh, crossing a border either due to war or to direct violence or threat of violence upon their person. So that is very well understood within the annals of international law. Now, going beyond that, Trying to define an environmental refugee is considerably more complicated because uh, 
first of all, the concept of a state being extinguished due to climate change is not exactly a longstanding concern. It's only something that has been looked at seriously um, a very short time ago. And you bring up the important point, not only in terms of logistics, not only in terms of how that would be undertaken, but also the idea of nationhood, the idea of we've seen many states be extinguished by war in throughout history, but to have a state uh, be extinguished due to climate change, this is not something we have any precedent for. And not only is this an issue legally, it is also very much politically. And one point that was made very clear when I was walking around Tuvalu is that, you know, we are a nation, we do not want to leave. This is certainly be a very, very last uh, resort tactic. And our focus is to, like any government would, preserve the nation, preserve the state. But how to reconcile that under when you're dealing with such a small state and one which is especially vulnerable to environmental security concerns coming from multiple directions, uh, it's, it's very understandable that many Pacific governments have really tried to internationalize this issue, to really kind of raise the alarm, to say that this is not something that is only going to be felt in one small corner of the world. This is going to have significant effects on not only on people, but on international law and international discourse. So it's not an accident that we're seeing uh, delegations from the Pacific uh, go to the Arctic, go to various international conferences to say, you know, we need to be heard about this. Thank you very much. Um, on, the, on the issue of nationhood as well, um, what do you think is going to happen to, to maritime boundaries? I mean, given that most of the countries have uh, exclusive economic zones that, that are rather limited, um, I mean, they're, they're very widespread given the, the, the island nations, but what do you think is going to happen once uh, sea level rises threaten this, this very livelihood? of the people, I mean, given that they're mostly dependent on fishing uh, in, in many of the nations. Yeah, and I would point out that when we talk about maritime zones, uh, in many cases, we are talking about significantly larger areas than the islands themselves. Kiribati, for example, not a very large state in terms of land, but its exclusive economic zone is bigger than India's landmass. So this leads not only to the problem of monitoring, but it also leads to the problem of, okay, if we start to see significant shifts in uh, land and land use in the Pacific due to climate change, what is that going to do to these long established boundaries? Plus we started to see greater interest in kind of emerging areas of uh, Pacific economics, uh, for example, seabed mining. And we've seen a few rumblings, for example, uh, boundary disputes in the past between Fiji and Tonga, which unfortunately could be a precursor to greater international disputes. Uh, if we start to see economic developments along those lines, and if we actually start to see the very significant threat of land areas of some Pacific uh, nations be threatened or perhaps even extinguished. And again, the law is trying to catch up with all of this. This is not something which was seen as actually viable up until a very short time ago. So the discussion is trying to catch up with reality, and we're definitely seeing this in the case of New Zealand. Um, in other countries, for example, Australia, uh, immigration remains a very touchy political subject. So trying to bring that in often creates uh, added problems. But I am kind of mollified by the fact that, for example, New Zealand is having a very uh, concise debate about this in cooperation with Pacific communities in the country. All right, we have a follow-up question for the um, maritime security uh, issues. Um, from Monica, who asks, to what extent do you think the, those countries in the Asia Pacific could cooperate regardless of the development stages of the Pacific nations? Okay, it's an excellent question. And it is something that is been very heavily debated, um, especially in Australia and New Zealand, because there's the acknowledgement now that there are many Asia Pacific countries that are interested in improving their diplomatic and economic profile in the region. So you have various agreements such as the Cairns Compact, which has been trying to set up to better coordinate uh, various aid practices because uh, overlap or basically contradictory policies obviously don't do any of the actors any good. Now this gets a little bit problematic when we talk about China, however. China's been quite wary about too deep engagement when it comes to aid and uh, Pacific diplomacy. And part of the reason for that is internal political, like trying to gauge, for example, how um, developmental assistance is 
um, discussed and implemented from China is a very complicated process. There are many different uh, agencies involved. There are many different uh, processes that are completely opaque. And very rarely do you have an idea of China's uh, engagement policies until they've already been pretty much announced and underway. So this has been a bit of a frustration to other countries because they're a little unsure where exactly China's priorities are going at any one given time. The, the need for greater cooperation, therefore, is really linked to the fact that there needs to be um, not only a coordinated effort to get an idea of what the priorities should be, but also to prevent that overlap. And now with Japan, obviously, a major actor in the region, uh, we're starting to see increased interest from, for example, India and Southeast Asia. We're also starting to see the United States back in the region. So that's going to be another question there. So the number of, the number of actors is growing and therefore the need for the dialogue is growing uh, at the same time. And again, this is why I'm a little bit concerned about the China-Taiwan situation that will obviously create complications for some pretty necessary dialogue about um, kind of Pacific cooperation. All right, we have another question from Frida. Um, are there less widespread or known approaches considering environmental security in the region than the ones you addressed in your presentation? Yeah, I do stress that the kind of six bullet points that I put out are not uh, meant to be exclusive. Like these are how kind of the discipline, like looking at uh, academic papers, for example, this is kind of how the dialogue is shaping up. But I certainly don't say it's the last word on the subject. And for example, we are going to be seeing, I imagine, quite a few studies that are appearing now connecting more solidly health and environmental security in the Pacific, especially as a result of COVID. I think we are also going to start to see significant studies about um, great power versus medium power versus small power approaches to the subject. And I think we're also going to start to see some very serious uh, discussion about uh, different formats of regional cooperation. Now, in regards to, like, for example, the importance of human security, I think that is also going to need to be uh, kind of further diversified because you start off with the idea of security of the individual and that's fine, but then you get into particular issues of, okay, what levels of threat can be seen? What levels of challenge can be seen in regards to economic opportunity, in regards to changes to individual ways of life? And we're starting to see kind of surface approaches to that, but I think that you know, there's still quite a bit more to be said on that level. Very true indeed. We have one final question okay. uh, from Johannes, who, um, who says regarding sea, rising sea levels and climate change, which outside powers and regional organizations are the most supportive of the Pacific Islands in international fora? Okay, very good question. And um, my first point on this would be uh, track two, for example, sub-governmental organizations, I think have a very significant role to play here. And I'm hoping that once conditions permit, we'll start to see kind of a reinvigoration of track two dialogues, especially like if, um, if we do see a continued split, for example, between Micronesia and other parts of the Pacific region, track two might be one of the ways to at least keep an open uh, dialogue going. So I would look there as uh, kind of your first stop to see which organizations are kind of best suited to deal with, in some cases, very thorny environmental security questions. I think though that at the end of the day, the PIF is still in the best position to handle these issues directly because of its inclusiveness and because of its kind of longstanding status. But I think we're also starting to see um, various, for example, UN agencies and various um, uh, related organs also start to look at the region considerably more seriously because of the fact that many of these areas have been internationalized. But I would say at the moment, I think track two is probably going to be the order of the day to try to uh, really get a lot of these uh, issues kind of uh, debated and to get them really kind of circulating in the hopes that they're pushed up to the track one level. I mean, uh, staying on, on, this, on this very topic um, and maybe wrapping up the session, um, let me give you an opportunity uh, to, to like lay out final, final comments you, you might have on how should we proceed? What's, what's the best way forward? Um, maybe in the short term, maybe in the long term, what is the most ideal uh, way or, or approach to, to reconcile the divide and, and try not to push it into extremes? I think 
Probably the first priority is uh, to make sure that the specific threats, the specific challenges of environmental security are kept at the top of the agenda. There is going to be a great deal of political pressure, I think, in, at least in the short term, that is going to be placed on the region, both internally and externally. That a lot of attention is going to be refocused on regime building and rebuilding in the Pacific, and I think that's probably going to take up quite a bit of mind share. I think that we, as we start to see actors such as the United States return to the region, the great power politics issue is going to dominate the agenda in uh, the region quite a bit. As you pointed out, like quite a few news services, as soon as the news of the split between Micronesia and the PIF uh, became known, there was like the first thing that was discussed is, okay, how is this gonna affect the US-China relationship? Which is important, but again, we need to look at you know how, you know, the specifics of environmental security are going to be affected as well. And I think there also needs to be the understanding that this is really a question which needs to be looked at through not only a diverse set of levels, but also a diverse set of directions, not necessarily keeping to strictly environmental, but also health, also sociology, also culture, that this is very much uh, turning into a very multi multidisciplinary area of study. And I think that this is going to need to be looked at uh, not only by academics, but also by policymakers. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your very um, fascinating uh, presentation and this, this great discussion. So thanks thank you, a everybody. lot, Michael Antain. And thank you for the audience uh, for very good questions. I'm going to wrap it up here now, and I'm hoping that we're going to have more discussions on this topic in the future. And um, I'm going to let you all go now and enjoy the sun, if there is sun where you live. And uh, yeah, great seeing all of you. And until the next time. Thank you very much, everybody.